During my lifetime, I have dedicated myself to this struggle of the African people. I have fought white domination. I have fought black domination. I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve. But if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. We will fight on the beaches. We will fight on the landing grounds. We will fight in the field and in the streets. We will fight in the hills. We will never surrender. I have a dream. That my four little children will one day live in a nation in which they are judged not by the colour of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. My name is Simeon Bennett, and I'm the senior speechwriter to the Director General of the World Health Organization, Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus. And the three excerpts I just gave you are three of the most famous sections from three of the most famous speeches in the past century. The first, Nelson Mandela's I Am Prepared to Die speech a three-hour statement delivered from the dock in a courtroom in Pretoria, South Africa in April 1964. The second, Winston Churchill's We Will Fight on the Beaches, delivered in the House of Commons in London in June 1940 as Nazi Germany swept across Europe. And the third, of course, Martin Luther King Jr.'s famous I Have a Dream, delivered on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. in August 1963, a pivotal moment in the civil rights movement. Three speeches that changed the world. And three speeches that demonstrated the power of words to change the world. And after all, that's what a speech is. Words that are meant to change something. A speech is not just about imparting information. That's a lecture. A lecturer doesn't particularly want you to do anything with the information they're giving you, apart from retain it and hopefully use it to pass an exam at some later point. Um, and don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's vitally important. When I arrived here this evening, I asked Parker where the bathroom was, and I didn't want a speech at that point. I just wanted the information preferably as quickly as possible. <laughs> but a speech is something different. A speech usually imparts information, not always. But a speech is also intending to have some kind of impact on its audience, to motivate them, to inspire them, to make them angry or sad, or to get them to take some kind of action, like voting for a candidate or buying something or taking up arms. And in a way, that's what this event tonight is about. The other speakers and I are giving you information, yes, but we're also hoping to have some kind of impact on you. We hope something we say will resonate with you, that you might go away remembering something we said, and that you might even take some kind of action based on what we said. So work for gender equality, or renewable energy, to reduce your carbon footprint, or even to become a speechwriter. Now, you might think that that is some kind of manipulation. And in a way it is. But if you think about it, that's how we all use words every day. We all use words to achieve what we want, to get what we want, to express our emotions and our feelings, and to elicit change from others. And we do more than just use words. We choose words. We choose the words that convey the information we want to convey, but we also choose the words that we think are most likely to get the outcome we want. 
to get the reaction we want. And this is why your parents taught you to say please. Because you are far less likely to be successful if you say, pass the salt. Then if you say, would you please pass the salt? Both contain the same request, but one is considerably more likely than the other to result in the salt being passed to you. The words we use and the words we choose to use can have an incredibly powerful effect on other people. You're worthless. You're amazing. I hate you. I love you. Great job. You're fired. <laughs> when I was at primary school, we had a saying, I don't know, maybe kids still say it, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It was a way of fending off playground insults. Except it's completely false. Words can be just as damaging, if not more so, to a person than physical violence. I think the Australian band in excess were a bit closer to their mark in their song Devil Inside, which contains the lyric, words are weapons, sharper than knives. And words can be weapons, depending on how they're used. And words can be used to express love and compassion. Words are incredibly powerful. They have the power to build up or to tear down. They have the power to create or destroy. They have the power to drive a person to do incredible things. They have the power to crush their spirit. They have the power to make peace. They have the power to make war. They have the power for good and they have the power for evil. Nelson Mandela, Winston Churchill, Martin Luther King Jr. were all highly skilled orators. But so was Adolf Hitler. You can't mobilize an entire nation behind an idea like Nazism unless you know how to use words to influence people. As a speechwriter, I spend all day, every day, trying to find the right words. Not for me, but for someone else, for whom English is their third language. I'm literally putting words in someone else's mouth. And when those words come out of his mouth, they have to sound like him, not me. I learned this the hard way. The f one of the first speeches I wrote for Dr. Tedros almost six years ago was for an event at Columbia University in New York on preparing for pandemics. And I began the speech, or rather, Tedros began the speech, by describing the 1918 influenza pandemic, the deadliest pandemic on record, but without saying what it was. So the speech began by describing how the pandemic started with one case at a military camp, and then how it spread rapidly across the world, killing millions of people with no vaccines or treatments to stop it, and wreaking havoc in communities, cities, economies, and nations. And then after describing the pandemic without saying what it was, the punchline was, this is not some future apocalyptic scenario. This is what happened 100 years ago. And I thought that was a great line. I loved it. I was very proud of it. Until he said it, or rather, didn't say it. He stumbled over the word apocalyptic. And what was supposed to be an aha moment in the speech became an aha moment. And it wasn't his fault. I had chosen a word that I liked and that I thought was magnificent. But it was a word that most native English speakers would never use, let alone someone for whom English is their third language. So I've never used the word apocalyptic in a speech since then. But since this is my speech, I'll use it as much as I want. Apocalyptic, apocalyptic, <laughs> apocalyptic. Now, the key point of that speech was that the world was unprepared for a global pandemic. And it outlined five things that the world could do to be better prepared. Well, 
It obviously wasn't a very good speech because when COVID-19 arrived three years later, not much had changed. Never in a million years could I have imagined that I would be putting words in the mouth of the Director General of the World Health Organization during the most severe health crisis in a century. But that's what I've spent the last three years doing. And those three years have been the most exhausting, stressful, exhilarating, inspiring, motivating, unique years of my career. I've written a lot of speeches, most of which I've forgotten, many of which I'm very proud, but perhaps nothing that gives me quite as much satisfaction as the speech I wrote just a month ago that contained these words. It therefore gives me great pleasure to declare COVID-19 over as a global health emergency. To be clear, it was not me declaring COVID-19 over. <laughs> you get the picture. Now, I don't pretend for a second that my speeches have changed the world in the way that Mandela's or Churchill's or King's did. But then again, they probably didn't think their speeches were changing the world either. And indeed, Mandela's speech achieved nothing, at least initially. He and the other seven people on which he was um, on trial with were sentenced to life in prison. But Mandela did not have to die for his ideal. He lived to see apartheid abolished and a new South Africa born. And the words that he used in that courtroom were the same words that he used when he was released from prison 27 years later. And those words are now written on the wall of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Winston Churchill's speech did not win the war. It dragged on for another five years. But it did galvanise a nation that had seen Belgium, the Netherlands and France fall to the Nazis and that thought it was next. Martin Luther King Jr. did not live to see his dream realised, and most people would say it still hasn't been realised. But it did give birth to a movement that was unstoppable. These are speeches that shaped the past. Who knows what speeches will shape the future? Who knows what speeches our grandchildren will be talking about in 60 years' time? Probably not any of mine. Now, you or May and I may never give a speech or even write a speech that changes the world. But every day, we all use words that might change the world for one other person. You and I may never have the profile or the position or the platform of a Mandela, a Churchill or a King. But we have something more powerful and potentially even more dangerous. This. The impact of Mandela, Churchill and King's speeches was limited by their reach. The audience that was present and those who heard it on the radio or saw it on TV or were able to read about it in a newspaper. But Twitter, Instagram, Facebook and other social media give you instant access to an almost unlimited global audience. And while Mandela, Churchill and King spent a long time preparing their remarks and considering what they were going to say and choosing their words carefully, you can fire off a message in seconds to hundreds, thousands or even millions of people without considering it for a moment or considering its consequences. Social media gives you the power of words and the power of reach that politicians, dictators and despots down the ages could only have dreamed of. It's just like having a fully armed and loaded fighter jet without knowing how to fly or what all the buttons do. Social media is supposed to bring us together and yet we live in the most divisive world in decades. Is that a coincidence? I would argue that social media and the algorithms that power it are driving us further apart from each other, 
further into our own echo chambers, where we only hear and respect the voices of people who think like us and agree with us, and further away from people who might have a different perspective, a different experience, a different view that we have not considered. Now, I'm not asking you to stop using social media, but I am asking you to consider very carefully the impact of the words you choose to use on others. Because once you've used those words, you can't take them back. And you can't take back the consequences. Words have the power to change the world. They've changed the past, they'll change the future. Your words, your future, and someone else's. So please choose and use your words carefully. Thank you.